Yay. How many of you enjoyed the show? Can we give it up one more time for Miss Deidre Kelsey? Y'all can do better than that. She did a phenomenal job. So part of part of what we want to do with this conversation, with this dialogue, and part of what we want to do with our time together is make sure that not only do we talk about issues and we talk um, and open the space as safe space, right? This is not only safe space, but I want you to also know that this is brave space. It's safe space and it's also brave space, but most of all, we want this to be a healing space as well. Yes? yes. God and Jesus were mentioned in the film, so it's okay to say amen too, okay? We want this to be a safe space, we want this to be a brave space, and we want this to also be a healing space. What I do outside of my job here at Goddard Riverside Community Center, I am also a minister. Amen. Yes. So, shameless, shameless plug, I want to give a shout out to my church that's here, Antioch Baptist Church. We have some of our youth and young adults who are here. Thank you. So, there were some takeaways for me from the play. Um, and the first thing that struck me that um, Damon said was, where were you? So as we're having this conversation, I want that to be the question for every single one of us. No matter how young or how old you may be, where were you? When there was somebody who needed somebody to talk to, when somebody needed a place to go, when somebody needed sanctuary, when somebody needed a friend, when somebody needed a hug, do you know how many people's lives that you could change just by giving them a hug, just by telling you that, telling them that you love them and really meaning it, just by saying that you'll be there, that you got their back and really meaning it and having their back? How many of us have ever had somebody say, I got you, I got you, I got your back, and they don't show up? So the question for you today, and for you to, when you leave here, where were you? And where will you be the next time a young person is looking at you? Are you going to show up and be fully present? Because sometimes we're there, and we're there in body, but we're not fully present with all of us. So look at the person next to you and say, where were you? Now look at the person on your other side. And ask them, will you be there? And will you be fully present? So with our panelists here, I'm going to ask each of them, starting with Chastity, to, again, introduce themselves. Because I can read their bios to you, but I think it's better for you to introduce your own self and tell the audience what brings you here today and why you care about the subject that the play is about. Yes, Ms. Chastity. So my name is Chastity, and I'm a student at Coney Island High School. I am a Coney Island youth activist. I came here today to speak upon about this play and how it relates to me, what it does, and like, yeah. My name is uh, Marion Frampton, but they call me Tiny. I'm a, I'm a former gang member of the 70s, one of the largest street gangs in the city of New York, the Black States. And I'm here today as a community activist today because I truly believe that this play here shows where our kids are today because the spirit of God and the spirit of love is gone. And, and today, it's just a whole new different concept from when I was in the street. Peace and blessings, family. Peace. My name, thank you for the peace. I appreciate it. Can we say peace? peace? Put the vibration of what we want in the atmosphere. Say peace. peace. 
Thank you, I received that. So my name is Sister Aisha Sekou, and I'm the CEO and founder of Street Corner Resources, and we are uh, one of the pure violence sites, particularly we serve Harlem, and uh, we're part of the crisis management system here in New York City. And uh, we were, up until recently, uh, about two and a half years in with no homicide in the area that we had been given. Uh, recently there was a, a shooting that interrupted that. So my um, work has been for real on the ground in the dark of the night with young people um, that were really trying to take each other's lives. And I've probably seen more than any human being that has not been in war should have seen. You understand the carnage from street violence and mothers begging for their sons and daughters to be brought back when we would see life leaving. And so um, for me, when I see the part of the shooting, it, there's a, a bit of trauma that happens for me because it, it's like being shell-shocked a little bit, I guess. It's, you know, too many times when you've seen that kind of thing and you know the result of what that is. You know, when you hear it a block away, two blocks away, it becomes real almost when you're hearing it here. And I saw other people experience that too in this room while the play was going on. So I just want to say that um, my team is here, Street Corner Resources, the Speak Peace Forward team, they're out in the street uh, at, the, at night. I don't have to be out there by myself. I have a team that's out there and um, we're really proud of them. That's the Speak Peace Forward team and our young people that's part of Speak Peace Forward. And so we're on the ground on a daily basis uh, interrupting and de-escalating violence and we have a contract with Harlem Hospital so whenever there's a brutal beating, a shooting, uh, a situation of domestic violence uh, where there's a beating, um, we show up. And um, you know, I'll just say this and then I'll stop. Uh, we, we just had in Harlem a double homicide and a suicide and a baby, a child, small child was killed in that incident. Uh, about two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, there was a double, a double homicide and a suicide. And then we were in Queens, um, that Monday, for the funeral of Amir Griffith. We were at the funeral, we took food and all of that to offer consolation to the family. And that young man was killed on a basketball court and he was 14 years old. So I sit here to tell you that gun violence is real. And I always ask people to get into action before it's on your doorstep, before it's in your household. So I'll stop. Uh, uh, good afternoon, I'm A.U. Hogan. Um, and the first thing I would say that um, this performance could be no more real than it was when you see the tension of the young brother that was persisted that he needed someone to stay in the game with him. I'm the president of Basie Park Houses. Uh, if anyone has heard anything about Amir Griffith, he died on the basketball court that I designed in 2014. Uh, so it's, it's like the sister said, it is very real. We cannot wait. Uh, in Queens, from, from September 10th to about October 15th, we lost 17 people to gun violence. So um, I work for Life Camp Inc. I'm the chief of streets, and we're an anti-gun violence organization also. And we might have 15 staff members. 12 of us didn't sleep for about three or four weeks just to attend to the violence. We must get in front of the bullet and act before these young people get angry because what comes behind the anger is violence and it's either gun or slashing that they're using. The right of us and the majority of us are not doing that. So we must find power in those numbers and make sure another young child is not dead. Thank you. Question. I know that the play was focused on young people and violence with young people and young people being in gangs. But if you paid attention, Damon was older than Lamont. He was not his peer. 
by age. So can um, you address how it doesn't all, it's, it's number one, it's not always young people, and it's not just young people, but also sometimes these things are introduced to us by people who are older than us, who are like a father figure, who are um, like an older brother, or people who, if we find ourselves in a place where we don't have something at home, or we feel like something is missing, they fill in that piece. Can one of you all speak to that? You know, um, the, the, the sad thing is, is that the trigger is pulled long before the trigger is pulled. And oftentimes, the stage not this stage, but the life stage is set up for that trigger point. And oftentimes in our community, uh, maybe if the young person had been to prison for a short bid, they had some influence with someone that they may meet later. Um, and then the need to belong is great in our communities because families are not the same the way they used to be. Families did everything together, they ate together, they planned vacations, they were at the parents were at the uh, PTA meetings and all of that. And so family was a major part of it. And now young people are seeking family uh, from the street. And that's, that's what's making gangs so attractive and oftentimes so brutal because when somebody has the, the need to belong so strong, they also, even if they don't have the desire, they will act on things uh, that that older person is telling them to do. You know, I, I just say real quick, I had a young person in a school where we were working and his father had, had been blood for forever, right? And his father did time. And his father was um, actually is in this work now in the Bronx. But his son grew up as a pup. You know, he was young, but he grew up as a pup. And his father, not knowing any better early on in his son's life, taught him that he was supposed to be a certain way. So once his father came home, his son was turning into a man, and he did right a certain way of being that he taught him over the phone, from jail, all of that. And so when he came home, he didn't have the same control. That's why we gotta be careful what we teach. And so his son, uh, was going back and forth with him like teenagers do with their parents, having disagreements. He put the son out of the house. The son went to live in the gang house. And the first thing that they did after about four or five days was put a gun in his hand because they wanted, the, the, the big homie wanted him to, to take the life of um, his child's mother, who, you know, this is like a, another person child's mother because she had taken him into court for child support and he could possibly get locked up. So you see how the situation moves. It's what they call cyclical. It'll go around. And so, you know, we have young people who think that they're on the path being led by somebody who knows and they're being led by someone who doesn't know out of ignorance. So I'll just um, give that. You know, but basically everything my sister said is true. But you gotta go back. I take it back. I do a lot of speaking engagements. I teach do a lot of speaking in school. And you know what's shocking to me? I'm now talking to twelve and thirteen year olds. Where before we was talking to junior high school kids in high school. But now you're talking about the influence. We gotta go all the way back to the crack epidemic to where we destroyed a whole generation where grandma was once 55, now she's 30, mm -hmm. okay? Our kids, our kids are coming out into the neighborhoods. When I grew up, we had places to go. Yeah, I was in a gang. We destroyed everything we touched, but we had the PAL, we had community centers, we had churches, the schools. When I look at these little young girls sitting here in the front, when they come outside, maybe one or two of them might have a community center in their neighborhood. They don't have no choice but to come outside and to look up to those that stand in our side. Then you're going back to where, like I said, with the crack epidemic, where, where, where now the children are socializing. We was once told, you do what I say and not what I do. Now you understand the kids are telling their parents, you do what I say. And the parents are listening. We don't give our children enough opportunities or choices. In the Bronx, where I'm at, we host, 
we do public safety dinners around the Bronx where we try to bring clergy, politicians, police, gang members together to realize that all police ain't bad and all black folks ain't criminals. But then again, when you, you when we bring people together, you know what they first say? The young kids say, well, we don't have nowhere to go. Who's my idol? That brother right there who's older than me, who's on the corner, who's buying a new pair of sneakers every week, who's smoking a blunt and drinking weed and, 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 and got our kids looking at him like he's the man. And she's right. A lot of it is, 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 is like family in blood, in blooded to where the father's to the son. But nowadays, a lot of this stuff is gone because our kids stand outside. And they, and, and they imitate what they see. That's right. And what they see is us standing on, on big, the big guys on the corner all day. And our kids done lost, and I hate to say it, but it's true. Our kids lost the fear of a, of a, of a knuckle fight. Because somebody told them it was important now. To, and, and much easier to shoot. So, you know, this war, this war is real. And it's like every day in the Bronx when I wake up, and I'm telling you, it's like being in Vietnam. Somebody, we, we, there's no respect for our elders, and there's no respect for life itself. And, if, and, and, and in order to change, we got all, we got a lot of different organizations out there that are doing well. But they, we all need help too. Because the system got to change. My little sisters up there got to find somewhere to go where they can't be influenced. My little brothers and them got to be able to play. That young boy in Queens, like they said, playing outside, minding his business, and got killed. I don't know. Please forgive me. I might make a statement. I might be wrong. But if there was a neighborhood where he, a uh, gym or something in his neighborhood, maybe he would have been inside. You understand what I'm saying? But, and the bottom line is, she's right too. We should be able to be outside and be safe. But right now, it's not working like that. And I blame the communities. You take one block back, one building, one block at a time. We will march on Fifth Avenue for, for somebody's lives and go back home, and we don't do nothing. Look at the person next to you and say, where were you? Where were you? So, Chastity, can you share a little bit of your story? Well, first I want to add on to what Dana said, because it also goes towards stereotypes. So, stereotypes influence a lot of things. So, like, it goes towards, like, so, they see somebody in the corner, like he has said, they see somebody in the corner, and that person in the corner goes and says, oh, they see us as this way, we have to be this way, to teach them that we're not tough, like, we're not scared of them, or us like that. It goes towards stereotypes and colors of skin, and it goes back way, way back. And it just keeps piling on us. People feel that we was born like this, born into it, so we had to keep it that way to show them that we still have our touch to everything. So like it gets piled on and piled on, and then it's getting worse, and then it decreases, and it gets piled up back. So I think just gets added on, and then it comes back down, and then when we finally get control of it, people see and finally notice that oh, this hasn't gone on in a while. Let me restart it. So the stereotype of all of it, it comes back, and people are like, oh yeah, we was born like this, so we gotta bring it back up, show it back out, and it's like, doesn't help. But um, my story, um, so this play touched me a lot to see um, my mom see his father die. When I was five years old, my mother got shot in front of me. Thank God she didn't pass away, she survived. But it's like triggering because it's like, this sound of a gunshot is scary now, but it was scary then, but now that I hear it, I was like, it's kind of no point because it's going to happen sooner or later. Somebody's going to die. I and mean, it's just like, it's tiring of hearing it over and over again. So it's like, kind of irritating. And it's like, this play like, touched on it a lot. And it's not to, not to even know who killed your parents or who shot them. And it's just, when you finally find out, it's like heartbreaking because you don't know if you're close to that person or not. So. We're going to open it to the audience. If you have a question, there's a mic on the side. We're going to ask that you ask a question and not make a statement so that we can continue with our dialogue. And thank you so much for being brave and sharing your story with us, Chastity. It means a lot. What 
character in the play did you guys feel like you most connected with and resonated with? What character in the play did you feel like you most resonated with? It's, it's kind of it's kind of hard, but I resonate with the one where I lost faith. You know, where for a period of time, even I didn't believe that there was a God. Now, mind you, I grew up in a uh, church. I mean, in, in a church and a family that went to church every day. But after a while, when you got when I got on that street. And, and, I, and I found my street family, I kind of lost that faith. I found it, which is good, but I lost it. I kind of identify, I, I identify with basically most of the guys in, 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 that, um, in, in the play, because I did find my faith again. Okay. You know, at first I was going to say there was no character that resonated with me, but the young lady who was trying to keep Lamont in the church when I was 16, getting ready to go to college, and I often put this on the back shelf. I was dating this guy, seeing this guy, right, and um, he had uh, shot somebody. And I was make, trying to make a decision about how to handle that at 16, how to handle that. And so it's that, it may not have been the outer, um, indeci outer indecision of Anyway, it was a, an inner conflict, and um, somewhere thinking that things would be okay, and you know that that's not okay. And if that person makes a choice to stay in the street, which was also his choice, he later did 25 years for another crime, right? And I'm just so glad that, um, I don't know if we're on live, but, <laughs> you know, this is years later, but he did 25 years. And um, what it showed me is that the energy that my mother put into me, those words that were already there, you know, speaking to me like of who I am and her investment in me and that I wasn't going to invest my energy into a man who had, who made a decision to just stay in the street. He chose that over me. So I was good with it. But it, it wasn't an easy thought. I'm just thinking about that now. It wasn't, an, it was like, you know, that kind of thing, and I was getting ready to go away to college. So I went to college, he went to prison, he did 25 years, and I'm grateful for the life that I have. Mm -hmm. The character that resonated with me most was the young sister. Uh, there's a play that's called Mrs. Strata, and um, they got to get, because men kept going back to work and stuff like that. So the woman in town, you know, believe that if they did a took a particular position on how to relate with the men, they would control the men in the war. The young lady was really caught between of uh, loving God and loving flesh. And that is so often in our communities that um, women begin to idolize things that look very charming and look very uh, pretty to them. And believe me, the power of the woman is a lot more powerful than the gods in the streets and the guns. If we stop, if, if young sisters stop being so attracted to these things, we make it a little more simple, at least to have a conversation about young men, what should we do now? Because right. not only your mother has left you because she's afraid of you, not only your father doesn't know what to do with you, now if you think about having a family, it's impossible because the young sisters don't want you. So the young lady was the most uh, resonating um, person Spike, I connected with. And Spike Lee showed that yeah. in his movie. Yes. Um, I can't think of it. Chirac. Yes. And I think that was the message he was trying to get yes. to show the power of young women mm -hmm. and, and their influence on the behavior of young men. And so if anybody gets a chance to view that movie again, it might be good to just kind yeah. of see that what he's saying is is withhold giving them all of you, whether it's sexually, physically, spiritually, and withhold so that the behavior is different. Don't accept the behavior of the killer. Mm -hmm. Good girls like that, guys. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask one more, one more thing, Aisha. Just this one thing is just you know, we're passing. Um, just we don't don't get don't think that this is not designed. Right. There was when the young boy was living, they they was they were singing and said that they want you dead. This is a system that has us going to prison, our mothers suffering, 
and our children being so afraid that they believe that the only way this can't happen to them is if they gun up and if they gang up. So this is this is a system, and we have to really study when we go to school and really understand that some of the stuff that that we learn get the get A's, get the best grades that you get. But you got to understand, you got to look at your history and realize that we're in this condition. Characters really like tender with me. It was the char the characteristics of them, the part that they played. It was just kind of they were all like connecting and like easy to relate to because it's like everybody has shoes to fill, and I filled almost half of them shoes that were on the, the stage and on the floor because it's decisions that we made and it's just life that goes on and goes on. So it's like go through a lot. So like the characters weren't really relatable but they were relatable at the same time. Yeah. Do we have another audience? Oh, uh, I have two questions for Mr. Kennedy. Um they, they kinda of lead on to each other. Do you know what a game was originally made for? Yeah, can you do you know what a game was originally made for? The games? I'm going to give you the history of the black space, and the black space is related to the Black Panthers, and the Bloods and Crips, and a few others. When the black space came into existence in the 50s, or 60s rather, late 60s, they didn't come together as a gang. The black space, black space came together to, to, out of the Soundview projects of the Bronx. They came together to help their community. Back in, back in the 50s and 60s, we had a lot of it was a lot of the drugs. A lot of our brothers and sisters come from Vietnam and it was coming back and we had a lot of, I'm going to use words that I shouldn't, but dope fiends running around, robbing and stealing. Also, back then we fought a lot of white gangs. So when the Black Spades came into existence, they were called the Savage Seven. And the reason why they were called the Savage Seven is because there was, set, there was a, quite a few of them, but the seven of them were martial art artists. They were from the Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam. They had no desire to be a gang. So now, but as time prolonged and the leadership turned over and, and as, the, as the membership got larger, our founders drifted away because that wasn't their concept. And the, 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 white, the, white, the white police and the white gangs was calling us niggas and spicks and booty, booty. So you know what they did? The brothers took the name Black Spade because it identified with us. Black Spade, strong. So a lot of brothers and sisters don't understand. A lot of these gangs don't, didn't derive, did not, out of violence. The Spades came into existence to be an organization of helping their brothers and sisters in the Soundview Project of the, of the Bronx. And they turned out to be one of the largest and most toughest street gang in the city of New York, and they had to fight to survive. Bloods and Crips, some of the brothers that I met on, out there, they, they give me similar stories. The Black Panthers, you understand? None of these brothers wanted to do they, they, they came to help the community. But I, I'm not to say it the way it is. But back then, with the white culture of the police, they wasn't allowing us to be anything other than violent. They wasn't allowing us to do anything. So, you know, and, and, and it's like, it, it, it's, I'm gonna leave it like that. But I think right. the truth be told too, um, during, this, during the late 60s, mm -hmm. uh, in the time of the Black Panthers, my, my mother comes out of that era, I come out of the household, and I, I, that comes out of that era. And I remember when, um, and I don't know the whole history, of uh, the blood set, but I remember when they were talking about the, the bloods getting started, there's a brother, um, I'm not going to call his name, he's in, in Harlem, and uh, he was a, ba a baby blood, but he was also a baby panther, and then he became a baby blood, but uh, that was created really to help the community. The, the blood set was created, the crypt set was created to help the community. All of that was created to help the community to bring things and be righteous and a certain behavior and a certain way of being in the neighborhood and to protect the neighborhood. There was a lot of stuff going on with the police and uh, 
you know, people being um, mistreated and, you know, a lot of stuff around drugs. So it was a whole history. So I think uh, that's a good place for you to, the good place for you to start is just on your smartphone, because I know you got them, is to just kind of see what you can find out about one, yeah, gangs in New York, period. But, uh, you know, find out about how these gangs started because it was not how they have ended up. And so um, the other thing when I took the mic, what I wanted to say was about the infiltration. Infiltration means that you have your group and the FBI and the CIA put people into your group to cause a certain kind of imbalance, and this is the truth. And so the Black Panthers were infiltrated. The blood set has been infiltrated over and over and over again. Same thing with the Crip set, same thing in jail. There are people put into the prisons to infiltrate the, the different sets that are controlling prisons all across the country. I just have to tell the truth. They're there, and that's how they keep what they call a handle on the movement of certain gangs because some gangs are really controlling or have been controlling from prison to prison all across the country and they don't want that. So you have to just know that some things have transpired because of infiltration and it didn't necessarily start with the set itself. It started with the infiltrators creating that mindset that made the energy of that set in the way that they wanted it to be. Some things are, just like you said, are created, are created that way. So when you do your history, when you go and you, you do your Google search, make sure that you look up COINTELPRO. Right, exactly. Something called COINTELPRO. And you will see that the government set up for um, the Black Panthers, as Sister Aisha said, the Black Panthers, even there were agents who were walking with Martin Luther King and who were, um, you know, dealing with the nation of Islam. And if you look at what happened in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, you'll see COINTEL with MOVE, yes, with um, COINTEL PRO. And even there was like a radical white group called the Weather Underground, right. COINTEL PRO. If you look at some of the pictures, like if, if you took a picture of like all the people who were back here, like from my sister back, my sister in the burgundy um, top, all the way back, if you look at the files and the history, if this was your set, right, or if this was like a Black Panther meeting or a gathering, COINTELPRO, the, the government blacks out all the stuff that they did in, in history, right? If you read the transcripts, there's black marker all over stuff that right. like the government put in there, right? So if they took a picture of this group right here, Cointel Pro people who were who were working for the government, they blacked their faces out. So there are one, two, three, six, nine, twelve people. About eight of them, their faces are blacked out because they were working for the government, and they didn't even know who each other was in the group. That's how it worked. So when you do your Google search, make sure you look for something called Cointel Pro. COINTELPRO got on the inside and destroyed stuff from the inside out. That's right. We have time for one more question, and, and I'm going to give EJ hats. We're going we're gonna to get another voice in because they had another performance. EJ. Okay. And COINTELPRO is short for Counterintelligence Program. So look that up. Y'all look that up too. Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, one, I want to thank you for your presence and you know, just being in the room right now and having this conversation. But um, my question was, what do you think is harder, the physical struggle of being in the street or the mental struggle of trying to get out of that path that, that, that life allows? That's a good question. All right, you just got the word for the best question today. <laughs> all right, look, um, you know, what happens is they're both really interconnected. Um, you can't really put your hand on what's more uh, of an influence.
because it's a mind, physical, and a spiritual struggle. And one of the things about this piece, it wants to connect with that spiritual relationship that we don't do no more in our households. You know, um, a lot of people say it stops at, st starts at home. Yeah, that's, the, that's where the problem is because there's a lot of trouble at home. And that too was the design. So if you look at young people, and we, we during the 17 murders in Queens that we, I spoke about earlier, we had to take one gang and put them away for 30 days this is to stop retaliation. Because after the seventh, after the fifth murder, most of the gang members wanted to get out because it was this particular set that lost five people. But prior to that, they didn't want to kill 11 people. You know, so to intervene and do a mediation, we had to physically remove these people. And when you sat down with, and speaking with them, it was both the physical threats that were given to them for trying to get out and the mental stress of trying to get out simultaneously. You know, so the thing that I say to young people, don't start in it. You know, this, you can stop right before it comes. Your, your strongest battle is going to be that initiation of them trying to come to you. Because after you bring yourself back in, like Lamont went back in, it became more duff, difficult for him. Tell the young people, don't do it. It's not like Nancy Ray said, just don't say no, but really take a stand. Because unfortunately, we have something that's called Facebook and social media where information travels very, very fast. But the truth and the falsehood travels at the same time. The young people just don't have the ability to differentiate which they should listen to. That's why it's very important for mentorship, for mentors, for clergy, and parents that really are on point. Our parents, that right now these young parents, they can't not know what gang activity is. It's inexcusable that you don't know what happens when your son goes into that street. Because the environment, the environment is influencing the kid, the child is not influencing the environment. You know, he, he said it all in a nutshell, but I'm just going to add this to what he's saying. It is so easy physically to be attracted because sometimes that's all you see until you get caught in the mix to have to pull that trigger or have to beat down that person. A lot of people come to find out that mentally they're not with it. You know, when you guys come outside and you see the brothers and sisters, oh, it's attractive. I, it's physically, I'm, I'm with it. But when you get caught up in the mix, or you get sent to jail, and you got to, you get sent to jail, and you got to, you got to do longer than 30 days, and then your crew ain't with you, or you get caught up in something, or you pull that trigger. A lot of people think you pull that trigger, it's all right. I know a lot of people today who's running around. You see how that brother would kept seeing his father, and how his father kept reminding him. Well, I'm going to tell you, the ghost of the past is no joke. And, and, and that's why you understand a lot, of the, a lot of these young boys, you understand, it, 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 it's like they're telling. They say, oh, they're snitching. They're not really snitching, man. They're they, 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 they telling because their conscience, and this is not where they wanted to live. It's eating them alive. So physically, oh, I'm attracted. But you know what, though? It's here to beat you up. You know, I just wanted, wanted to... Uh to say to young people, um, I, run, I run a program and we have young people with us um, almost every day. The only day we have off is Monday, and Monday is hardly ever a day off for me and, and for some of my staff. Um, but I, I would, my thinking is to keep young people too busy to be. Too busy to be caught up in the street, too busy to be caught up in somebody's game, too busy to be sitting in the cell with a door you can't open, too busy for all of that, too busy to pull a trigger. Because as long as they are engaged, you have them with you, you have the opportunity to speak to them, you have the opportunity to educate and uplift, and on those down days, when you know I get young people, and <sighs> it's been some situations, not necessarily with this group that I have, but inside a public school where I was, and I remember and I was grateful that I was there on that day when a young person wanted to go and shoot someone because his family moved out of a shelter. And you know, shelter living already is pressure on a family. It's a lot of stress. At that time, people were in one room in a hotel, and you had to have all of the kids in there. And you know, it's just an uncomfortable situation. And his family was able to get out of the shelter and get an apartment, a small apartment. He had a laptop 
that was given to him by some organization that helps the homeless families. And the friend came over. He went to go buy the weed. Friend came over and left with the laptop. Now, all of this that he's been through, the only thing that he owns after not having anything is stolen by somebody he trusted. And the good thing is, is he came to school that day. And we were able to have a conversation about that, and we were able to keep the door. We had to lock the door from the outside. We had to do a few things that's unorthodox, right? You know, that they arrest people over. But you know, you do what you have to do because this is a, this work with keeping young people away from violence is about doing what's necessary. And sometimes we have to fight the other stuff if we have to. Hardly the good thing I never had to. Um, we have to do what we have to do to save the life. And if a mother, anybody could understand that. But um, I would say my message to young people, because I don't like to leave without uh, talking to the young people, you know, get involved with things. You are greater than being at somebody's beck and call to pull a trigger for girls to just have sex with different guys and you don't have anything, that, you know, for you in spirit or anything. They, you're just being you. Basically, you are just a vehicle for some negative activity and for somebody else's call. You can be the vehicle for your own call, doing whatever it is you want to do. Act, dance, mix, produce, do a play like this, you know, run a company. You can do anything you want to do. And I know that from my own place of being. When I wanted to just run with the black spades up in the Bronx, that's what I was trying to do. Thank God for my mother, boy. My mother show up at the party and disrupt the whole thing. She she was a, a, a violence interrupter, coming with her own violence. You know? But I'm just saying that you know you all are powerful, and if you don't think that you are, just say I'm gonna do this, and just set out to do it, and the the help for you to do the thing you want to do will appear. And don't be afraid to say to somebody, you can reach out to us and say, I want to do X, Y, and Z. Let's figure out how to make it happen. Things don't happen overnight. It's work. It's work. But it's easier to do something better for yourself than to sit behind bars for 25 years wishing you didn't pull the trigger, wishing you didn't carry the gun, wishing you weren't in the apartment when the trigger was pulled and you saw everybody that hit the floor and now you got to testify and you get time too because you didn't report the crime and not reporting the crime means that you are a conspirator, a co-conspirator on the case. You understand? This thing gets deep. And people say, how did she get there? She got there because she was in the room with the gun, provided it, didn't tell her the crime was committed, and now she's a co-conspirator, and you know what? Ain't nobody visiting her. So, I mean, you got to get the real truth. The real truth. It ain't no fun and games being locked up. Ask somebody who did time, and they'll tell you. They will tell you. It ain't all that glamour stuff where you orange is the new black. That's a bunch of BS. Ain't nobody ro roving around no prison like that. They just not stealing people's sanitary napkins. That ain't happening like that. That ain't how it's going down. You don't have none in prison. That's how it go down. For real. So I would rather see young people and I encourage them and challenge them to create the life you really want. Be courageous. Be fearless where your own life is concerned. Thank you, Sister Aisha, and I'm going to let the rest of our panelists give us their last word. Well, my last word is this. Thank you all for um, staying, and I really appreciated this performance. It was, it was marvelous. A lot of things don't move me, but I'm over there moving in my seat. Um, I'm angry that I didn't bring three million people with me, because now i got to go try to remember every every word and every piece that you... But um, really... One thing is that go home if you're having a question about going to prison to join a gang. Sit in your bathroom, turn your light off for 23 hours. Take the toilet paper out because you ain't going to have that to use. And don't go out for 23 hours. Leave no, no cell phones, no kind of, and no kind of, no kind of contact with anybody else and just stay there. Because that's what 25 years look the Sergeant Confinement. They try to take it away, but when they took it away, I work in Rikers Island, and believe me, it's worse than that. Mm -hmm. Our program is in Rikers Island, so I don't want to miss 
misconstrued that I'm a correctional officer. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what I am. 2008, this is to you, brother, and I'm finished. 2008, they closed the community center in Basie Park Houses. May Bloomberg closed down most of the nights of uh, community centers, left 19 open. Okay, across the city, left 19 open. There's a PAL that's right across the street from where the brother had got killed at. So what happens, they wanted them to fill out an RFP, with, um, which is request for proposals, and no one wanted to get it because of close proximity to the PL because they thought they wasn't getting money. The PL doesn't let the community get to the building. Design, design, design. Understand that. I want to leave this for the men in the room, and, and I'm going to take this as, as an example of my life. My brothers, look in the mirror if you've got children, because when, when your male sons look in the mirror, they see you. Nineteen years ago, my child wanted to be like me. He wanted to be like me so bad that he spent 30, almost 30 years in a federal prison. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how bad it was going to be. And, and this is when I go out and I do my public speaking, I talk to the men. Because I'm out gang bangers, drug sellers, regular fathers on a regular job, a hard nine to five. Our children, our male sons, look at what we are. And, 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 and the only thing that I have, my son was just here tonight. He's only been home a year. He did out of 30 years. He did 19 and a half years in a federal prison, and he did an interview. And he said, "I want to be just like my father." I started to cry. I ain't got no money, so he ain't, I ain't gonna leave him the money that I ain't got. But I can leave him with a legacy that's saying that your father was better than what you see. So I always tell the men when I do my public speaking, pay attention to your sons. Watch what you're doing, because what you don't think your son see, they see. And my son see so much that I cost him. He got 30, but with Obama in office, he got a lot of time cuts. He did 19 and a half years. He was only, only 19 when he went to jail for 30 years. And right now, he's not here now, he left. But I say to you brothers, pay attention to your boys, no matter what you do. That's right. If you're a hard worker, he wants to be a hard worker. If you're a drug dealer, he wants to be a drug dealer. He wants to, our children, our male son wants to imitate us. Thank you for saying that. Thank you all again for staying and listening. Um, I want to say that um, there are a lot of things that we can put our mind to as long as we see the positive and block out the negative. Because the more you think on the negative, is the more you want to be like the negative, and it's not a good place to be. It's horrible. It brings you down. Hopefully, you have somebody by your side trying to take you out of that negative spot. And when you do, you realize that life isn't really a game. It's it's something better, and you need to cherish it and use it to an advantage, especially this generation. We know more than we need to know, and we don't need to take advantage of what we need to do. Wow. Wow. Thank you all again. Have a good night, I guess. So thank you all for staying. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for making this a brave space and a safe space. And I hope this can be a healing space, too. Thank you.